I hope you are uh, all, all up for another 45-minute session here at the Accounting Web Excellence and Practice Chat Show. Now, some of you have been to a few of these before. Uh, uh, the first thing in the morning, we had a, a kind of a question time on, on business advice, uh, on, on added value services. Then, then it got a little bit more Jeremy Kyle for business consultancy. Uh, so this time, I've only got my, uh, our expert speaker here, and, and the case study we're going to explore is, is Gabelle's uh, managing director, founder, senior partner. General Dog's Body. General yeah, Dog's Body. Yeah. Paula Tallon. Uh, and it's going to be parky this time, so it's just much more, you know, cosy, grey-haired man <laughs> sort of saying, tell, tell us about your latest, uh, latest project, Paula. So, so, so a little bit more, you know, genteel afternoon, but, but the same applies if you, have, if you weren't at any of the previous sessions. Um, I've got a set of questions here and we'll be bantering around, but if there's something you want to ask Paula or, or even an observation or a challenge, you want to challenge something she said, just put your hand up. We've got some microphones, Joe at the back has or a microphone, so we'll, because we're going to be filming this and saving this to put on the site and report on it uh, as a case study. So uh, let's start. welcome Paula, thank, thank you for you. joining us and giving up your time. Um, and I guess to set the scene, how, how did Gabelle come about? Um, well, it has got a long history. Since the age of seven, I always, always wanted to work in tax, it was my dream. And I know that sounds really weird. And you're going to ask, how did I know that? Well, I grew up on a farm and my mum used to keep the books. And we had a visit from the tax inspector and my mother went, what do you mean school fees are not tax deductible? And I thought, wow, my mum was like, she knew all these really clever things. But she played a really innocent game. And the tax inspector goes, Mrs. Tallon, it's okay you didn't know these, just don't make these mistakes again. And then I thought this man had the power to decide how much tax my mother paid. So after that, I just really wanted to do tax. I started in accounting at the age of 14 with my summer jobs. Do you remember the old Kalamazoo systems? Yeah. I started yeah. with Kalamazoo systems. Yeah. Always wanted to be a chartered accountant. Don't know why, I just the only type of accountant I knew. So I became a chartered accountant and straight away I specialised in tax. And I went into, after many years in various practices, went into Chiltern, a specialist tax firm, and I thought, I'm home. I found my dream, a business that only does tax. We were acquired by BDO in 2007, and I found myself back at an accountancy firm, and I thought, oh, this isn't for me. So um, in 2010, I left and I set up Gabelle, a specialist tax firm, and we're now 20 people, and we only do tax. Brief potted history. Okay, well, thank you. Um, that's, that's quite interesting. So, so you, uh, was it just you, or did you, did you just start with a small core group of, of colleagues? Right, now this depends on who's listening out there, because <laughs> it was only me. Um, um, obviously, I didn't know my colleagues would follow me, and some of my colleagues did follow me. Um, I started out originally because I had various restrictive covenants. It made it very difficult to start up. So I started with Talent Tax, which was just me, while I worked through some restrictive covenants. And then six months later, five of my original team joined me. And uh, the day they joined, I unveiled Gabelle. Now, I'd had six months to think about what the name was going to be. And I wanted one name that was linked to tax, but wasn't Joe Bloggs or tax something. And uh, I came up with Gabelle. Now, Gabelle was a tax on salt in France at a time when people used salt for preserving their food. So the government said, well, you know, if people use loads of salt, let's tax it. So people started to smuggle salt, and were, these were the Gabaloos, and they'd come in, and then there was the customs people who used to try and catch them. So I thought, Gabelle, it's a good name. It's linked to tax, and I love it. And I built the brand around that. When we took on our first French client, I thought, oh my God, have I insulted the French? <laughs> um, but he loved it. He thought it was the most amazing name, and he told me even more of the history around it. And for our Italian clients, they've told me that actually they use Gabelle as a swear word for tax. <laughs> uh, so I didn't quite do my Italian research right. there. But um, yeah, it's just all about sort of coming up with the name and everything. So my colleagues, previous, uh, my previous colleagues, they joined me and we launched Gabelle officially. And three and a half years later, we're up now to 20 people. And I'd love to get that to 30 people and then we're big enough. Right. That's as big as yeah. I want to go. That, that naming and branding, and I guess that, that time you spent you know, conceiving the mm -hmm. business, uh, you know, if you've got any questions, that's not really quite the area I was going to dig into, but if, if that kind of issue does interest you and you are sort of maybe thinking about striking on your own, it's a great time to ask Paula. 
But so six months in, you, you sort of get this influx mm -hmm. uh, of, of your colleagues. Um, did they come as a package and fit the model you had in your head? Or was it slightly a random collect, you know, was it, was it, was it a random collection? Mm, they wouldn't want to be called a random right. collection. Um, I, I just wanted tax experts, but I, I wanted people who were in tax because they loved tax, not because, oh, it's a job and it's something you can do. I wanted people, not quite as nerdy as me about tax, but people where it was more of a, like a vocation for them, that they got excited by tax problems. You know, if you hang out in our office, we get excited about the most nerdy of points, but some of them are quite good, and um, they do lead to us learning something new, but it's always really good to have a discussion around those tax points. Uh, the people who came across first, I knew their history, I knew their strong points, and their strong points far outweighed any other points that would have prevented me mm. um, taking them on. But what was really good was to bring new people into the mix, because the difficulty with bringing a team in that you've worked with before is, well, we've always done it this way, and this is how we've done it before, and you can't get that change. By bringing new people into the mix, we got a real change in how we do things. But we started off with very much a sort of a cooperative approach. The whole thing was we've got a flat structure and we're all in this together. And for me, the challenge is maintaining that as we grow and we get to 20, 30 people, maintaining that sort of culture of where we're all in this together. But actually, someone needs to take responsibility and we have got bills to pay and we have a firm that we need to run. Uh, some of the messages that we've heard from from the sort of the consulting experts and the sales experts and Raoul is is, is kind of begin with your end in mind, um, and also what was you know knowing what your why is. Did you have the you know during that six months? Did when you set up go, or talent talent tax, did you have a very clear vision where you wanted to get um, and why you wanted to in what you, the why apart from loving tax and just wanting to live tax, but, but how clear was that? Uh, I'll probably get shot down by every marketing person out there, but for me, it was more about the journey than the destination. I wanted to do something I really enjoyed and work with people and clients I really enjoyed. And yes, I want to build a successful practice, and yes, you know, I want to be the best and have the biggest independent tax consultancy practice. But for me, it's about building it as we go and not necessarily where we're going to get to at the end. Um, life's a journey, isn't it? Enjoy every day. So again, just to take you back, so did, did you conceive it that ultimately you did want it to be a very sort of wide and full service um, practice or, or maybe you kind of realised or felt that it would be, you know, I'll specialise in this area, this area, this area, and as I add more, you know, if the right people come, I can expand into their areas of special expertise. Well, our core market has always been the accountants and the lawyers market, the advisors, advisors. So, you know, if you're stuck on a problem, you've phoned all your free helplines and you think, where do I go now? Well, that's when you're supposed to call us. Um, we're not free, obviously. Um, that's why we're the last resort. Uh, but also, we deal a lot with entrepreneurs as well who come to us with their accountants and working with them. So the core market was always accountancy and lawyers, and to this day, it's still that market. We'll always have the ad hoc people who come to us, but much of our sort of marketing and our sales and everything we do and the content we provide is very much aimed at the professional's market. Here's another question that popped up in one of the earlier sessions. All, the, all of my best questions are actually the ones that are coming from, from people here, so thank right. you. So keep them coming. Um, do you have a business plan? I do. Yeah. Uh, when, when I sat down, because I have an external investor, because I couldn't afford to pay six people um, on day one, because these people have mortgages, they've got school fees, they've got families. Uh, so I did bring in an external investor, and as part of that, to get the financing, I had to provide a three to five year business plan. So I did sit down and do my business plan, and I revisit that business plan every quarter. And there's bits in that business plan that are no longer relevant. But at least by having it in the business plan and revisiting it, I, I have some, some kind of a road map as to where I want to go. And it's interesting, the things in that business plan that I thought maybe wouldn't be big things for us have become really big things. Some of the issues I set out to deal with at the outset, I still haven't had a chance to deal with those, and I'm still working towards dealing with them. But it is good to have a business plan, yes. And kind of what, if you can, we're not, well, I don't know, maybe we're potential investors, who knows. Uh, but what, Open what, to offers. Yeah. Can you give us a hint, you know, an idea where, where you think you want to be in three years? And, and well, I, I wanted to get to 30 people, and I want the turnover to be, I don't know, 12 to 15 million. 
if I can get to that, mm -hmm. I'd be very happy. Um, the nature of our business is very different. It's very different to some of the firms that you'll deal with because we have a quite flat structure, because the whole ethos behind our business is when you phone up one of our consultants, you're phoning someone who could be a tax partner in your firm. So you don't want the newly qualified going, I'll go away and look at the book and come back to you. You want somebody going, it's a good question, but actually, what are you trying to achieve? Is there a better way we can achieve it? And not just giving you the answer to the question you've asked. Um, so trying to grow with that model. And my difficulty is getting the right people. And what I've learned is I, I've learned to deal with people much quicker. When I was in a larger firm, if I had underperformers, <coughs> they got lots of chances at me, because I'm quite soft, lots and lots of chances. Uh, when I have to pay their wages out of my pocket, the chances aren't there as much anymore. And um, I do, if we have underperformers, I deal with them much quicker. And in the three and a half years, I have had to let two people go who, not necessarily underperforming, but just weren't right for our model, or perhaps didn't have the expertise that I would have expected. So, yep. Uh, we need a microphone. Joe, we've got a mic down at the front here. Or, yep. Okay. <laughs> and if you could stand up, please, just so we can yeah. catch you. Um, do you find that you're, you've, um, you've, you've developed a reputation in specific taxes, or you've tried to keep it, if you try to cover all taxes? Uh, because sometimes when we've um, um, gone to a um, consultancy, and talked about inheritance tax, they were they seem to be we weaker on that. Or so w we're still searching. <laughs> I can help. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it, what no we sales, found. No what we have, what we have found is that there are a lot of tax specialists out there. But mm -hmm. you end up finding they're specialists in specific areas, and uh, uh, f because um, you know, w being a general practice, um, we do we do quite a bit of tax, but what I would call vanilla basic planning. Yeah. And there's always a situation, even in mm -hmm. small businesses, which you do require specialist help. But trying to find that um, consultancy out there is, is, is easier said than done mm -hmm. sometimes. Uh, I understand. And uh, that was in setting up Gabel, one of the key things was, is that no person can be everything. And that's a key thing that we have at Gabel. So to answer your question, you know, as regards how we deal with specialisms, we have two people who do VAT. They don't do anything else. That's their day-to-day -day job. Inheritance tax, we've got a team who deal with inheritance tax and trusts. I myself, I hate trusts. I wouldn't touch them. Um, but it, And then we've got people around tax investigations, because that's a really specialist area. You know, you can get your client into serious trouble there. And we've got international tax, so dealing with sort of the offshore angle and going overseas and coming from overseas. And then we have the general, what we call the owner-managed business side, entrepreneurial side. Because it is very difficult that, you know, the market has a lot of independent tax consultants out there where you have mm. one person maybe who's very good at certain areas, but they can't cover every area. And, you know, when, when I qualified in tax, I knew it all. I knew everything. Um, now I look and I think I know very little because I suddenly realise that how much there is out there. And my own specialism, my special do sort of owner managed business, entrepreneurial EIS, entrepreneurs relief, that kind of things. I don't do inheritance tax, I don't do trust. That I wouldn't touch. Um, tax investigations, would always give that to our investigations team because it is quite important. If people are coming to you as the expert, you must be the expert. And you know, and it's knowing when jobs aren't right. For instance, we, um, we were approached by a German company to deal with a really large job, which would have been a massive job for us. And uh, the uh, fee would have been into six figures. And I took the decision that I thought we didn't have the necessary skill set to deal with that. And much to the disappointment of some of my partners, I actually referred that work on to one of the big four firms. Now, in referring that work on, I've actually won a lot of work back from that because the lawyers in Germany who gave it to us, they responded by saying it's really good to deal with people who know what their skill set is. But that was really hard because that was the early days yeah. and we could have done with that money. Yeah. <laughs> Talking of, of the skill set, I was very interested your, your business plan was, was kind of related to the headcount. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm, I'm, is, is because it's so knowledge driven, is that pretty much the KPI of, of your firm? Is it just having you know, the people with the knowledge? Or does the business plan have any sort of incidental infrastructure and support things that actually allow your, your domain experts 
to concentrate and, and pull in the fees? Um, well, we, we have got a few other small things in there. We do something called MTR, which is a monthly tax review, which rolls out to lawyers, which is a small mini training thing. Um, we do something around fees protection insurance, but our core part of the business is tax advice. And all the model is driven around giving this advice. And to give that advice, we need people. And we need people who know what they're doing. So it's very so, much driven so by people. Expand. You know, we, we haven't got the kind of business that you can just, I don't know, have a, a report and then pump that report out at 10,000 pounds a pop and don't put any work into it. Um, we can't do that. All our work is bespoke. And it's also of advisory yeah. work that's done on a, a and, commissioned and basis. Just in case there are some experts in the room, I mean, will your expansion plan related to, you know, are there sectors you're very keen to to move the organisation into that you don't cover yet? Um, well, we had to look uh, sort of about a year ago, a year and a half ago, we looked at areas where we thought, right, where do we need some reinforced expertise? And we decided then, we do a lot of property work and we do a lot of share scheme work. Um, but I felt that the property work and the share scheme work we did, we could be doing much more if we had much more specialist people. So we went out and I got a share scheme person from Deloitte, I got a property person from KPMG, so we can now offer real sort of top level in those services. So every six months or so, I'll sit down with the other partners and we look at, have we got any gaps? Are there any areas we're missing? That's interesting because you're talking about the big boys now and, and big girls too. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, the big firms, quite high powered jobs, but it, the same situation applies to some of the smaller firms here is, is you know, where are the gaps? Um, and so before, so we'll, we'll go into that in a second maybe, mm -hmm. but, but how competitive is the specialist tax advisor market? You know, is, are there opportunities there for smaller practitioners maybe who, you know, to go in with a, a niche specialization to begin with? Um, I think, yes, there's always an opportunity because people like going to somebody who's an expert on something. And if you can develop an area that sets you apart, it's not going to be all of your practice, but it could attract something. And I, w I had a meeting with the Director General of the EIS Association recently. And one of the things she is saying is there are there's a severe lack of advisors in the EIS sector. Now, anyone who deals with enterprise investment schemes you know, it's really interesting, some really good businesses in there. Right, they don't all go on to become successful, but if that's an area you could get into, you know, those clients grow into successful companies, you get the director's tax returns, you get so much out of those. So to me, that's a good sector. Um, industry sector is always good as well, industry specialism. But I, I had, um, I'm fortunate enough to sit on a managing partners forum for uh, top 20 and then Bell. I don't know how we got in there, but it's really good to sit around the table with those managing partners and find out where they see the gaps are because the larger firms for years have gone, we need a, all these different specialists. And their big gap at the moment is owner managed businesses. They haven't got tax people in particular who can sit in front of a client and go, right, you've got a company, you've got these personal issues, you've got these companies issues and pull it all together. They need to take 10 people to a meeting to get that. And they're now realising they can't do that anymore. And I think um, last week or the week before E&Y launched what they call their entrepreneurial tax sector, which is good old fashioned <coughs> OMB tax. So it's interesting they've been mm. through the cycle, done the specialisms and are coming back around the mm. other way a bit. Do, do you need to be a boffin to to serve the owner-managed business market successfully, or is it, is it something that, that someone with kind of intermediate tax expertise but in those areas could prosper in or could? Um, it, it depends what, it, what you're trying to serve. It's, you know, for us, it's easy. We only do tax, and they expect you to be a bit of a boffin about it and to have some client-facing skills. But if you're going into that as a sector specialism OMB, you know, you guys as general practitioners, a lot of you have to have more probably skill set than I would because you have to have your general business skills, you know, you more client facing. There's a lot of different kind of skills and a lot of owner managed businesses, what they want is somebody who knows when to get help, knows the limitations and what they do and is someone who's genuinely interested in their business and cares about what the business does. Okay, I guess, oh, another one. Oh, uh, <coughs> can you, I think he beat you to the draw. Oh. Yeah. Uh, negligent claims, um, tax seems to play a very high, high part in that. What's your view on, I mean, it's possibly when general practitioners are getting into something they perhaps shouldn't have, but 
it's still um, it's still a high risk area. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, it it is a massive area, and we deal with a lot of things that come in where people go, this has gone wrong, can you help us out of it? Or worse still, we get a call from a lawyer going, can you, can you be an expert witness in this case? Um, I would always ask the name of the firm of the accountants because we'd never go up against one of our clients on this. Um, but the difficulty is, as general practitioners, it's very hard to keep on top of everything and it's knowing when you need to get that expert tax advice. But one of the things that makes it difficult is persuading the client that they need that extra advice. You know, so we operate a helpline and I can, someone can phone me up and ask me a question and I'll give them an answer and then they'll come back and say something. I go, well, you know, you need to explain to your client that they need to instruct you to do this. And they go, well, I've already given them the answer. And you're like, but that was a major piece of work for you. And, you know, it's teaching people the value in the tax work and making sure that you know, as accountants that we're quite proud of selling our services because accountants traditionally were very reserved when it comes to talking about prices and costs and charging and, you know, no, no, no matter what we put on the clock, not saying everyone, but the majority of people will look at and go, oh, that looks like a lot for that job. You know, and we tend to talk ourselves down. We don't realise the good work we do and we should be putting more emphasis into, you know, looking at what's a fair price for doing a job you know, persuading the client, you know, tax is high risk. Tax is expensive if you want the right advice. How, how do you, that, that's been a consistent question all through mm -hmm. this morning. So, so do you kind of price by the value you deliver to the client or? Um, we're very traditional. <laughs> what we do, if, if we're giving a quote for a job, I will look at the job. I will look at how long I think the job will take and then see what that comes out with on the price. And if I think that actually, it'll take a bit more then I'll add to it or if I think actually maybe it's just taken that long because the person doing it doesn't have enough experience and we should be able to sell it for X I'll, I'll take a view yeah. it's very varied I tend to work towards fixed fees because clients like to know from the outset what something's going to cost there's nothing worse than a surprise bill so um, you know I don't know if you've ever taken your own personal legal advice I had to take a lot when I was working through my restrictive covenants and I got to stage I hated lawyers' bills because on a Friday I'd get an email and there'd be a lawyer's bill and I think, what has he done this week? I just phoned him and asked him one question and I'd have two hours of time. And I found myself in the client position going, you know, you didn't tell me you were going to go away and research it. I thought you knew the answer. You should have said. So it makes me quite conscious in dealing yeah. with clients. Okay. We had a question down the front, Joe, this gentleman. Front row. We are a small, a relatively new practice. My question is around the service, if any, you'd be able to offer us. And the question is, when I'm sitting with a potential client, I want to offer them various tax strategies, IHT, for example, or there are others uh, that I'm thinking about. My question is, when I have a potential client sitting in front of me and I want to use your practice, if possible, I don't know how I can package that, allowing for your cost. Is there any packages you have for smaller practices like me, saying you tell her it this way and you present to your client like this? Um, first of all, you said no sales, yeah, didn't you? Well, it's, it's, <laughs> if, it's a, if it's a question for the audience, you're, you're allowed a free <laughs> one quick free pass. Well, yeah. no, do you know, it's but not yeah. about, well, it's for us, it's not about selling a tax strategy because I haven't got a toolkit here with 10 solutions I can sell you today because that's not how I operate. Um, what, what we would tend to do with somebody who perhaps, if, you, if someone was trying to pitch for a new client, and we do this quite a lot, if they come to us and say, look, I'm trying to win this work, if I win this work, there will be some tax work in there. Can you give us a hand? And we look at it and go, actually, there's huge tax opportunities here. And we might give them a few ideas to go in with on their pitch. That kind of thing we don't generally charge for because we know if they win the work, they'll come back to us. Um, if you have a client where you're saying, well, you know, just a review, we have clients who say, well, come down to our offices two hours every month and we sit and we go through the key clients and see if there's any opportunities being missed. I think. For a new practice taking on clients, probably the best thing you can tell them is you are the person who can deal with as in look after them, but you will know when you need to call in specialist advice. And 
educating the client to say, you know, if we have a specialist area, then we need to bring in a specialist to deal with it and educating them on that from day one. Because the thing about doing tax on the cheap, it does come back to bite. And when it bites, it bites quite hard. We've, we've um, thank you. We've um, sort of touched on negligence and, and I think there was a hint of sort of tax planning strategies. I mean, we, we, oh, we had one over there. Oh, this, uh, oh, wait. So I just want to ask, I'm not particularly wanting to give a tax advice, but for example, I've had quite a detailed chartered accountant next door to me, so he specialises in tax. But where I feel I'm weak on, it's a bit like, I don't know what I don't know. So could you recommend anything where sort of, I don't want to specialise in it, but I still want to learn enough that I know that I don't know it, if you know what I mean. I feel like I've sort of gone out of date from, you know, from my original days of qualifications. And I just feel the market's a wee bit weak out there, just to tell you, sort of, I don't want to be a specialist, but mm -hmm. what you're talking about, knowing when you should is hand it over to somebody else, yeah. because we have a lot of clients like that, and I, I quite like to improve my practice in that way. And so just kind of a beginner's ask. slope area yeah, of practice? Yeah, just to ask your yeah. advice. And yeah, it used to be one of these sort of old things we had at Chiltern when we went to our lecture and we go, the, the, the things you know you know, things you know you don't know, and then there's things you don't know you don't know. They're the things you're really worried about because how do you know till it goes wrong? Um, I, there's so much tax information out there, you know, but it, it does come down to reading it and being interested in it. And I would say like things like Accounting Web does quite a lot of tax on it. You've got sort of all the Tolly sites and everything. They do tax news. But also there's so many free tax events as well that go on like evening seminars at larger firms you know i'm never embarrassed to turn up at a pwc seminar on property tax i'll walk in the door and listen to what they have to say so never be afraid about going to someone you see as a competitor and going in and sitting in and seeing what they have to say about tax um and you know there are there are a lot of articles that are written out there and you know 10 pitfalls from preparing a tax return or 10 property traps 10 things you didn't know about entrepreneurs relief and they're great little snippets so you know that if you're dealing with entrepreneurs relief there are traps out there and to be aware of what those traps are so does that answer your yeah, question that's yeah. a good idea so to say I, I, we've been skirting around the avoidance quagmire like we, we've heard about negligence and tax planning um you know don't intend to get into that particular issue but but as far as the client firms you work for how do you assess their kind of risk profiles to you and you, and and it was just how do you go about assessing whether you know are they are they you likely to be dealing with some sensitive cases um, or high risk cases and, and what decisions do you make at that point? We, we deal with some very high risk cases when we're dealing with disclosures where people are at the highest risk, they haven't disclosed mm. their income for years, so we're trying to get them out of it. We, we as a rule don't get involved in tax schemes, it's not something we do and we certainly don't do sort of any pre pack things or anything like that. Uh, very often we have reviewed papers where clients' clients were going into schemes saying, you know, they've been sold this and they think they should go into it, can we have your view? Our view is normally that these things, you know, they come with let the buyer beware and in most cases they are going to come back to bite and it's a question of when they're going to come back to bite. Um, we have got some firms who we won't work with just because we feel that they will ask very specific questions on the telephone and they will take that and extend it into something where it's not meant to be or they will change the facts to suit the answer. Um, we, where I find we work much better with clients is where we have a really open relationship which, where they feel they can tell us everything about their clients because that way then we can work with them to get the best solution possible because if you've only got half the information you know while based on the half the information you might get a response actually if you've opened up and told us everything in the background on the clients it's much better and when I'm saying that I'm thinking of PPR cases <coughs> where you get the phone call to go, oh, they had two PPRs and they split up, and you're thinking, did they really split up? Um, and then there's something else that contradicts that, and you think, look, just tell me what this family's situation is, and I'll see if we can do something really good to help them. But if you're telling me things that aren't right, it's very hard for me to give the proper advice. And I like to think in a lot of cases where we get involved, we add a lot of value or we bring something to it. Um, we get a lot of calls going, um, could be something long, uh, this shareholder wants to buy that shareholder out. This is what I'm going to do. And, you know, nine times out of ten, we'll find a much more efficient way to implement that transaction 
where we have all the details. Um, so it's always worth when you you know when you're speaking to any consultant to just open up and give a, all the information. Um, during the exercise earlier, uh, when Richard Wyatt Haynes uh, asked us to, to ask a, a somebody else at the conference about a surprising fact, one gentleman told me he'd actually moved into tax avoidance schemes in the past seven months. Um, right. What, what advice would, would you? What advice would you give to a firm thinking of take following following that example? Um, everyone to their own. <laughs> I'm, I'm a very traditional tax person. Um, I, I, it's very hard to say to anyone moving into that field. To me, it's a high risk area. I've seen a lot of people make a lot of money out of it. Um, I've seen people go to jail over it. Um, you know, there's, it's a wide spectrum. And um, I suppose you, you do it knowing what the risks are. Um, one of the things I like is when I go to sleep at night, I know I've done my best for my client. And that's the most important thing to me. Right. Are tax specialists born or are they made? Is it a seven born year Born or made? Born or did you made? say boring? Born. <laughs> born. Uh, are tax, tax specialists, specialists are incredibly born boring. Or made. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it or in there? I, I suppose there are people I work with who fell into tax, but then fell in love with tax. Um, it's like anything you do. If you're, if you're interested in it, then you develop in it. If you're doing a job you're not interested in, um, you'll never develop very far. And, you know, I can say that from personal experience because as a chartered accountant, I had to do auditing. I hated auditing. I could never find those invoices. So I was just changed my sample to the invoices I could find. <laughs> so... That's why I never would have made a good auditor. <laughs> but I know that when I get up in the morning, I'm actually, I look forward to going into work and I get this beaming smile when I walk out of Oxford Circus Station and I know I'm getting close to the office. I get in there and I look at them sometimes and I think, oh, I wish I hadn't come in. Um, but it, it's, you know, I think it's something you can grow to love. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, it can develop. Can, can develop. But I'm sure people are born in particular ways. And I was, was quite maths orientated and quite problem sol solving. I love problems and I love solving them. Um, so maybe you have to be a problem solver. Maybe that's what you yeah, have to be born okay. to be. That's, that's interesting because my next question had to do with, apart from the, the, the pure technical knowledge that you actually bring to bear on the case, are there other <coughs> things that tax specialists in whatever niche or sector have to do differently than a general practitioner would? Do you, do you engage with the clients differently or any other differences? Um, no, I, I, I don't think so. I think you still need to be very good with client skills and there are some really clever tax people out there who never do very well because they haven't got the client handling skills and you know I think as someone who I worked for years ago when a client asked him a question he used to photocopy the revenues manual and hand it to them and to go that was the answer now that might have been the answer but that's not how you presented it to the client um, I suppose as a tax person you can probably hide away a bit more every so often and so put your headset on and get deep into a technical problem. As general practitioners, you're probably out facing clients a lot more. Thanks. Okay, and I'm very interested in the, the sort of human characters that, that we're beginning to talk about and deal with. Uh, do, do you think managing a stable of highly strung technical experts, is, does that present, because you know, you're, you're, you're bringing in as many of them as you can, and I imagine you, you have some interesting characters given their... their different realms of knowledge. Is that a, have you found that a particular challenge for growing about? Um, it, it is. <laughs> because how, do, how do you deal with it? How do you, how do you the, the thing about if you've got a lot of people who are really good at a particular thing, the important thing is to make sure you haven't got a bunch of arrogant people who think they know a lot about everything because in reality none of us are perfect. Um, and I always say to people, you're always going to drop something, it's just a matter of when you drop it or whether you're caught dropping it. Um, so well, what I look for when we recruit people, technical excellence is there, but there's also they have to be able to fit in with the rest of the team. And one of the things about our team is we don't have any prima donnas in it. We haven't got people who think they're too important to do a particular task. Uh, so, you know, partners and staff, everyone sits in an open plan office and no matter what pressure I'll come under from the other partners, they will not get their own offices because one of the things, it's all about being in one team. And it doesn't matter how you divide up the specialisms. At the end of the day, we're all in one team together. And I suppose the managing bit is just making sure that you're pulling together all those different personalities. And it, it's recognising 
the different personality types. You know, we have somebody who you don't speak to before 10 o'clock in the morning because that way we all have a good day. If you speak to them before 10, it all goes wrong. Um, we have someone else who comes in and you know by the way they hang their coat up whether or not you're going to engage in conversation. And if they hang their coat up in a particular way, you just don't bother engaging in conversation until they start the conversation. But in general, most of the people that work with us are fairly easygoing and quite relaxed. So I'm, suspect, I'm getting here perhaps that a bit of emotional intelligence is actually quite a useful <laughs> thing in your profession. I mean, wh where do you find the, you know, oh, we have a particular mental image of, of the technical expert being kind of an isolated character of, exploring the furthest reaches of legislation on their own. Where do you find people like that who are also team players? That's the difficulty. We would be at 30 people now if I'd been able to find those people. Um, it is very, very difficult to try mm. and find them. And one of the things we do when we recruit is one of the final stages of interview is a psychometric test. Now, if you've ever looked at the results of a psychometric test, there's no such thing as a wrong or a right, but the types of things we're looking for in there is, have we got people who won't work with other people? Have we got people who are not team players? Because they're the kind of people we couldn't bring into our organization. We're too small to have people who are not team players. Um, but as far as recruiting, we've been quite fortunate. Obviously, there was the people who followed me who I'd worked with before. Um, we've managed to recruit some from the bigger firms who were frustrated because they couldn't have any autonomy and one of the things we offer our staff is a lot of autonomy. And I also like to think we give people a break. I had uh, somebody who came over from KPMG in Estonia and he was a corporate tax expert. Now if you know anything about Estonian, co Estonian tax, there is no corporation tax. Um, so he walked through the door, having been recommended by somebody to come and talk to me, and he knew nothing about UK tax. He went home for the weekend, he studied the revenues website, he came in on Monday, and he knew a lot about UK tax. And I thought, the fact that someone did that for an interview, I gave them a break. And he, he worked with us for the first two years, and then his girlfriend wanted to move back to Estonia. Every so often I phone him and beg him to come back and work for us. He was brilliant. W were there any other characteristics? You know, that was, that was a commitment to hard work and mm -hmm. learning. Were there any other aspects of his behaviour that, that you know, signalled this is somebody who did fit your, your mould? You know, um, you know, what, what are the clues you can pick up early on that someone might fit? that he was quite determined in what he wanted to do. And also, you know, if he believed in something, he followed through on it. So, you know, if there was a technical point, you were having a discussion with him, he would follow through on that technical point, whereas some people give way too quickly. You know, and even if you're wrong sometimes, as long as you've got some conviction in what you're talking about and there's a reason why you came to that conclusion, it's better than changing to yes, no, yes, no, and not really knowing any idea what the answer is. Okay, we're getting quite near the end. Are there any last-minute questions? Any of anyone want to join in and uh, put their own questions? Okay, we have one at the right at the back there. Could could you hold for a second and stand up and uh, just so we can record your question on on the, on the tape? Do you do uh, research and development work? Um, I personally clients. don't, but I but have your firm. I have two people in house who do research and development. All oh, right. So it's okay. uh, how how rapidly growing is that part of the practice? Um, well, interesting. I. Just to digress slightly, I, I um, gave a talk to a Chinese delegation yesterday via an interpreter. I don't speak Chinese. And one of the things they were really interested in was research and development because that's what they're trying to develop in China, the tax credits around that. Um, but um, bec because that, that's linking very much into the pattern box and that's an opportunity um, we're seeing this missed quite a bit, the interaction of research and development, the pattern box there. You have clients who you've known for years who do something like, I don't know, moulded plastic, and you'll find out they've got a patent in there, and it's whether or not you could be accessing a 10% rate for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have another one, he another one here, and then one over there. <coughs> Hi, Paul. Um, my name's Rod Cumming. Um, just recently, sorry, just recently, I've uh, been experiencing a little difficulty with HMRC uh, with a client that isn't an LLP like your own organization but is carrying out professional services and HMRC seem to like LLPs and not too keen on limited companies. Is it, do you have any views on whether one should practice as a limited company when either tax specialist or medical practitioner or do you have any 
particular views on that. What do you mean? That the revenue just they're don't like the business structure? They're, they're saying that, that a limited company can't have any goodwill, for example, when it's carrying out professional services. Right. It's quite a big situation at the moment. I don't know if you're experiencing that. I, I think well, what, what they're trying to get to there is, in many professional services, the value of any goodwill is li linked to the people within the organisation and where they were trying to attack people is where you're transferring into a limited company saying well the goodwill can only be transferred if you're going to pay that person a proper salary to come and work there because they are the business but you know a limited company even if it had Joe Smith on it and Joe Smith was the main guy can build up its own goodwill because Joe mm. Smith can fall off a perch and that business can continue yeah um, but I, what I do find, like I'm dealing with a very tricky valuation at the moment, and some revenue inspectors, they don't live in the real world. They haven't been into a commercial business, and life is real, and business isn't about a textbook business, and there's a way in which a business has to operate to survive, and that's a reality they don't always see. Yes. But your own yeah. practice is an LLP. Our practice is an LLP, yeah. and of course our branding is very much Cabell. So it's not mm. me, it's not the other yeah. partners in it. Mm. And I'm very conscious that we push the Gabel brand as much mm. as we can because that's what the business is all about. It's not mm. about a particular um, partner within it. Okay, we Thank had you. one last question here on the second row. And uh, Joe will bring the microphone to you. Yeah, it's Kiru uh, from uh, Croydon practice. I run a small practice. You know, for consultants, especially on the tax consultancy, we pay an hourly rate of £450, which seems high, so sometimes the clients uh, are reluctant to pay that. And I wonder whether, because you do uh, tax investigations and things like that, do you have a fixed rate uh, sort of um, uh, which you can quote for the clients? So um, well, it's very difficult in tax investigations to quote a fixed rate because you don't know how long it's going to be unless it's an LDF disclosure or something. Typically our rates uh, range from 200 up to 395 an hour. That's the range of rates and for most jobs it's fixed fee anyway. So we'll agree a fee up front before doing the work. Okay, I think we have to wind up there. I, I really appreciate that, Paul. What, what, what I think I got from you, you, you know, you have such a sort of broad reach over the profession that, that, that you know, I, th I can't think we've, we've done LLPs in Goodwill and we've done uh, Touch and IHG, you know, you, you've, you've given us a little spotlight on a lot of different opportunities there. Um, and again, you've kind of made them all your own. Uh, what I've, I've sort of recognised, I hope, is that, that actually there are, it's, it's such a vast field that there are avenues in so many different ways. So, so maybe, you know, if there are a particular pocket of clients are into our, you know, are, are suitable for R and D uh, uh, tax credits things. And maybe there's an opening for you to develop there. But as a parting shot, Paul, uh, I'm going to assume quite a lot of the people in this room do want to maybe develop their tax advisory services. Can you help them with kind of a Jim Lawless, like a first step they can do tomorrow, that maybe to help them on their way, you know, to get them started down that route. Um, well, I suppose. You know, the starting point is just talk to your clients about tax because clients actually think that tax is quite sexy. There's quite a lot to talk yeah. about. You know, talk to them about their structures and what they have and just going to the clients with, you know, let's have a tax review. They like the sound of that or let's have a tax meeting. Um, but, but certainly, you know, there's always the basic things to look out for. You know, is your structure right? Are you IHT efficient? Um, are you efficient for entrepreneur's relief? Have you got share schemes in there for the employees? Are you dealing okay with the family businesses? You know, have you got properties sitting outside companies? There's loads of sort of different things you can look at. And when tax cases come out, and I know this sounds really nerdy, and I'm not expecting you to read the whole tax case like I would, but have a look at some of those case summaries because sometimes a tax case comes out that may be very relevant to a client that you have and you may get something from that tax case which enables you to go back and talk to your clients and sometimes it's really nice to be able to go back to your client and go you know you're in this sector well there was a tax case last week that said xyz and then you're, the client is thinking well he's a bit of an expert in this sector knows about this uh, you're welcome to look at our website <laughs> 
Um, we, we actually update our website on a sort of daily basis with different cases and everything, but you can go to the Bali website, which is the government's website for the courts, that has all the cases coming out. Um, but Accounting Web picked them up fairly okay. fast as well. Uh, yeah. There's a lot in there. But it's Mainly from the Gabel posts. <laughs> but it's... Um, I say, do you know, there's so many people writing on tax these days. You know, any websites that do any anything around tax, I think there's taxation yeah. web, there's all kinds of things. Well, well Paula, I, uh, Paula, I know, could probably talk for another hour yeah. on the subject, and you'd all probably, we'd all probably <laughs> listen as well. So, uh, we'd but all so I'm sorry to, to cut it off, you know, grab her at the drinks party at the, the awards tonight, but I'd like to please join me in thanking Paula once again for a brilliant talk. Thank you. Thank you.